Can everybody hear me now? Okay. So we'll start a little bit early because I think whoever wants to be here is probably here. Um, anybody here been to the Internet Wars Palo 2006? Not too many people, but okay. I guess we don't maintain our audience. Ooh. So the idea was to bring up a few slides and talk about things we have seen the past year and then just open the mic to everybody to talk. Can we actually arrange for a mic for everybody so they can ask questions? This will be most of the session. Is that possible? No microphones? Can we take one from the table? Yeah. Over there? No, no, this one. Over here. That one has long cord. So we can just pull. Okay, well, the so first guy was. Queue up down in front here. Yeah, if you have a question or something. Um, so this year we decided to skip on the actual presentation because it was, I, can't, I don't know when to shut up. And uh, if I lecture, it just takes a long, long time for me to do so. And uh, just start with questions from the audience. We had a lot of interesting things happening this year. Um, we had the, the, what did we have this year? Well, we had the Estonian information warfare thing going on with Russia, or not Russia, Russians. I'm actually lecturing about it later, but never mind. And um, that's not the main thing we want to talk about. We want to talk about, about the mafia. We want to talk about the general uh, phishing, fraud, botnets, DDoS, all the bad stuff, e-crime, whatever you want to call it that's happening, that's happening on online. We have people on the table that can answer very, very technical questions about malware samples, vulnerabilities, etc. People who can answer very general questions about incident response and how things are managed with global task forces. And for example, when we had malware on on the Dolphin Stadium website two days, on Friday, two days before the Super Bowl, how that was taken care of and how cooperation globally was managed. And we have people from law enforcement here who can answer questions from their side of things. So everybody has beer except for the feds? Good. So I'll let just um, everybody introduce themselves. Please, five words. Um, let's see, George Bacos, uh, Northrop Grumman, formerly Dartmouth ISTS, incident handler at the Storm Center. Tim Kasiba with the FBI. Joe Stewart, SecureWorks, formerly Lurk. Rick Wesson, Support Intelligence. Andrew Freed, Special Agent, Treasury Department. IRS. <laughs> Mark Sox, director of the Internet Storm Center. So, unless you want me to talk forever, which I'm more than capable of doing, um, do you guys have any questions you would like to start us off with? Yes, please step up and take the mic. Uh, so, uh, I assume you guys heard about the, the ISP who uh, started redirecting connections to a particular IRC server to a kind of dummy server that would try to rid the whoever Cox. connects. Yes, Cox, thank you. Go ahead, uh, what are your opinions on that? Um, I would actually like just one of you to answer that because although related to botnets, it's not internet wars. It's response. So who would like to take that? Rick? Um, I had a fun perspective from this. What we, we support intelligence tracks and aggregates data about malicious activity. And so one of the things that we tried to understand is we looked at Cox's network before they did this and Cox's network after they had done this. And we didn't notice a statistically significant growth. Um, uh, it's the mic, please. Uh, we didn't notice a st statistically significant decline in botnet activity from their network. So, it, you know, what it was doing was having people connect to a, a server that issued five or six different commands that sometimes remove malware from infected machines. So from the outside perspective, we can't tell that there was actually any um, uh, positive effect. Um, now, they, Mark, would you like to actually comment about why you think they did it and if it's a good idea or a bad idea to the approach itself, not the technology? Yeah, so just in a, who, who asked the question? Or, yeah, yeah, so you know what they did, right? So Cox took uh, any DNS queries that looked like they were going to CMCs and they just redirect them. A um, lot of, uh, you know, consternation over that's an appropriate thing for an ISP to do. 
Right, exactly. So from a business perspective, it makes perfect sense. It's their networks. You don't like Cox, go to Verizon. I mean, just, you know, switch, right? But from a let's keep the Internet pure, it's designed to do the things that we want it to do, you know, bad Cox. It's like uh, VeriSign when they did SiteFinder a few years ago. Did it make the bots go away? No. Did it make Cox's networks a little cleaner? Perhaps. I mean, not much. Is that what you're saying, right? So I think it's, a, it's the type of business reactions we're going to see in the years that come. The Internet's run by businesses. It's not an academic thing anymore. It's a, it's a business venture. Uh, consumers vote with their wallet. If you lo don't like the way your ISP is performing, find another one. Now you sell your house, move to another neighborhood. <laughs> That's what we all do anyway, right? Well, that did, one second, George. Yeah, one, one comment. How did you find out that Cox is doing this? I mean, we, we knew it for many reasons, but how did you find out personally? Slash dot. Was anyone contacted by Cox to tell them to tell you that you know, as a customer, we're going to protect you by taking these additional steps? I don't want to pay a vendor for a service um, unless I know exactly how they're changing my requests. Rather than a, uh, that's arguable. Is, is Jennifer here? Well, they're publishing anyway. You're pulling your DNS service from them, and you can point your DNSs at anybody. Who's who runs open? Anybody here from Open DNS? You guys familiar with Open DNS? All right, check out Open DNS. If you if you see if you go to them, you don't have the Cox problem. You're completely redirected. But guys, oh, that's true. That re take this question, mush it around, and bring in something I want to do. Um, we always argue about ISPs not doing enough, and the ISPs argue, well, why should we? Not because there are bad people that are trying, but it's not our job, etc. And there is, on the extreme end, the regulation, and the other extreme end, there is free internet, don't be the internet's firewall. Do you believe, I mean, we know for spam, you have to maintain your systems, you have to filter. What do you believe would actually work for ISPs to implement as part of the system? What, uh, you know what? What do you believe works right now that ISPs can implement to maintain their systems and combat this problem? Let's start with Mark. Egress filtering. Nothing leaves the ISP unless oh, yeah, it's the basics. properly sourced. Basics, yeah. Basics. If they would just do the basics, yeah. You, uh, if ISPs were to globally deploy devices that um, adhered to BCP38, um, that would help a lot. Um, that's something that everybody can do today. Basics. Who is that over there clapping? Another IETF or in the... Who is that? What's your name? Joe. Joe. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, everybody together. Three, two, one. Hi, Hi Joe. Joe. But Joe is right because those of you not in the ISP world, BCP38 has been sitting there for how long now and not really implemented? Okay, let's move on to the... Unless somebody wants to ch chime in here. What's, let's move to another question. Yes. This is going to be a real vague question. I've uh, heard good arguments on both sides of net neutrality, good or bad thing. Not relevant. Next. I'm really sorry. No, hold on. I apologize to you, but that's politics. We talk operations. So I apologize personally. I'm the evil guy, not them. I'm the asshole, okay? Another question, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, how long do you think it's going to be before we start seeing ISPs uh, do instead of the DNS poisoning stuff, uh, start doing things with uh, like BGB table manipulation, uh, dropping routes for uh, things they consider hostile? <laughs> I think they're already doing it now. Yeah. Can we rephrase this question so that we won't fall into the political pitfalls because it is actually interesting? Okay, how go, go back to the mic. <laughs> He has EFF on his back. I'm worried. Okay, how, how do I deal with uh, ISPs that are doing this to me without my knowledge? Create your own DNS server and use it. Not DNS. No, no, BGP. 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 Yeah. So. Yeah. Create your own ISP. There's, yeah. a, there's, a, number of, there, there's a number of services, um, companies that are actually selling services to corporations, and how they manage it is injecting, you know, 32s or larger um, to no route inside the core of their networks. Um, it's no different to do that uh, for a corporation than it is for I ISP. believe what he's afraid of is, yes, okay, let's say, and we're not opening that argument, that this is necessary. We need to filter somehow to maintain the network, security, whatever else. How does he know this won't be abused? So I changed the question then to actually ask, 
What's currently done that he wouldn't like? If that makes any sense. What's currently done by ISPs, for example, to maintain their networks, to fight the bad guys, to somehow survive, that he really wouldn't like to be abused? Is that right? Am I? Okay. Well, yeah. I think that there's two things that uh, ISPs have done. One is walled gardens, um, where they put up uh, put a device's MAC address into a different pool so they get a different IP address that has different policy restrictions on the outbound ports. Um, another one is Trend offers a, a device which they sell to, um, Trend Micro offers a device which does this uh, BGP routing inside the core of the network, um, which would, it, it does a number of things, but it essentially it inserts uh, information using BGP, uh, which doesn't affect the external view of how a BGP routing occurs, and so I don't think that it's really an issue from a policy perspective um, on what's going on inside the core of a network. I think it's falling um, within there, right? I would like to move on at this point yeah. and um, reconcentrate on a different aspect. We know the ISPs need to protect themselves or us or maybe not, but what are they actually protecting us against? So I'd actually like to go to Joe Stewart here and ask him about some of the recent stuff we have seen, which we haven't been able to handle, or um, the most, the more edgy stuff that we need to handle right now. From the malicious code perspective, what's actually disturbing? What, what are the actual malware samples that impact the internet when they infect you, and stuff like that? Did you even understand what I was saying? Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, from the perspective of impacting the entire internet as a whole, you know, we don't see as much of the, the global worms and things like that because people have uh, deployed different countermeasures and, you know, everybody's got an anti-worm product now and, and it, the, the bad guys figured that out. So they've solely gone to targeting the end users through drive-by downloads. So, um, you know, it's, it's a mess out there if you're talking about, you know, your grandma, you know, your mom or your dad, you know, surfing the internet trying to just, you know, go a few pages and, and maybe do their banking online. It's a mess for them. You know, does it affect the internet as a whole? You know, not really. I mean, we don't see it on an operational level, but, but still it's just a, just a massive wave uh, of this type of activity. And that's the, that's the thing that, that I'm seeing and, and trying to deal with uh, in my uh, Can you call operations. Massive wave. Massive wave. Um, uh, how do you quantify just the uh, you know endless torrent of these uh, types of impact uh, and you know malicious JavaScript uh, hacking you know thousands of sites at once you know over you had the uh, the Italian job that they called it where you know they just had a field day just you know infecting anybody that, that visited a site almost uh, you know they got. Uh, you know, you think, well, I don't use Internet Explorer, so I'm safe. Well, that's not true anymore. You know, they're finding bugs in Firefox, albeit they get patched uh, faster, but still there's, uh, you know, Flash uh, has uh, recent vulnerabilities. Java has some new vulnerabilities. So unless you're running without all that, you know, completely patched, and, you know, Windows Update doesn't do that for you, uh, then you have problems. If you have, uh, maybe your Java is patched, well, unless you've removed all the old vulnerable versions of Java, uh, the bad guys can uh, script their uh, pages so that they just instantiate the older version uh, that's still on your hard drive and then uh, uh, infect that. So, um. Well, Mark, I believe you about um, a few months ago we responded uh, as a community, the Internet Security Operations community, to the Dolphin Stadium incident right. where suddenly all this stuff that's immense but it's background noise to us mm -hmm. happening. Then you, we were on a global conference call talking about, yeah, let's meet again. Do we have anything more to do? No, let's go sleep. It's the weekend and stuff like that. And then you came up with a question. You went to Google mm -hmm. and searched for the malicious code, and you came up with a question. And I believe what you said can really emphasize the point of how large this all is. Do you we remember just, what the question was, or you want me to talk about what we did? I'm trying to see if you remember it. Yeah, I know it was a good one. Let's just talk about Dolphin real quick. Do you guys remember that? This was uh, right before the Super Bowl back in... Uh, early February, I guess first weekend in February. So we get at the Storm Center, we got a, a contact and said, hey, something's goofy with uh, dolphinstadium.com. It's serving up a weird JavaScript. It's pointing to a, uh, uh, a site in China, downloading just a little piece of uh, code, which then if you pull it into your browser, you, nothing patching here, your browser is just executing Java code, redirects it, pulls down another loader, pulls down a keystroke logger. I mean, the typical stuff that we're always seeing. 
What we did, though, at the Storm Center is we took those strings, what we were finding inside of Dolphin Stadium, and went to Google for them, just kind of playing around with Google Foo there. And we found uh, close to 100 other sites that also had that same JavaScript in it. Started following some of them, and sure enough, it is pointing to the same Chinese sites. It's downloading the same piece of code. About a third of them, roughly, were um, hospital-type sites, which we thought this was a, a directed attack against hospitals. In the end, it turned out it was the use of Dreamweaver. Uh, people who were using Dreamweaver didn't, they had a little setting they were screwing up, these guys uh, had abused it. But what really struck us as odd was the why, you know, what's going on, because there's always a motivation behind this, and usually it's a criminal financial type of thing. They're going after credit cards or stealing your identity. In this case, they were interested in uh, World of Warcraft. That was the identities they were chasing. They wanted to get your World of Warcraft credentials so they could go in and, and uh, mine some more gold. They have these gold farmers over in China that steal your virtual credentials, go in and, and then steal your virtual cash and sell it in the virtual world. That blew us away. This is the first time we had seen the bad guys operating in the virtual world, now mapping it over to the real world and doing it through the um, dolphinstadium.com. So then we continued to pull the string, and it turned out this attack had been around since back in October. We had never even, hadn't even seen it, didn't even realize it was there. And uh, the number of websites that, but now that we knew what to look for, increases over 1,000 or so that had been infected. And it just continues on. We've seen you know, more things like that. Just very novel, real easy, and there's nothing that the user's doing wrong. You don't have an unpatched uh, uh, browser. You're doing nothing but just visiting websites and wind up pulling this, uh, this trash into your computer. There was actually something extra on that. I mean, yeah, that's cool, by the way. World of Warcraft cool. Gold, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, once we actually got the incident handled, I was on the phone and I said, guys, let's go to sleep, we're done. And Joe was talking about um, the malware and what it does. And then you came up with a question that I would like to really concentrate on. He said, hold on, guy. I just went to Google, and there is a ton of other websites out there doing the same thing. Right. How can you call this incident, handled, and shut the door? And that's what I'm trying to really, I mean, can anybody here try and explain why we all, I mean, we are on, on the stand talking about all these different incidents, and we speak of them as background. There's thousands of websites here, thousands of hacked users over there, millions over here, and you know, that's just background noise. And I'm trying to find a way to explain why we only respond, for example, if a global community to Dolphin Stadium incidents or to other such large incidents. How can we explain this? Can you help me out? Rick, yeah, that's, sorry. We can't contact the people that are responsible for the resources. I mean, as a company that's trying to find the people to educate, um, and the amount of education that has to go on is uh, significant. We, we, we track some 2.2 million events a day, and um, I, can't, I can't find all the people to give the information to so that they can go and, and do something with it. And the organizations are vast. I mean, you have universities that can do something, you have government that can do something but you can't usually get it to the person that... that we'll just get reinfected anyway if we, keep, if we could find them. I, I can George. tell you one reason why we really keyed on Dolphin Stadium is it was the first time we'd seen the virtual world. <clears throat> usually when something new comes up, we I mean, it is background noise. There's millions of this crap going on right now as we speak. Something new, though, happens. We'll key on it and start talking about it. Once that newness is worn off, it's background noise. Uh, are the bad guys getting in the virtual world today, right now as we speak? Yeah, they're doing it all the time, but it's, it's, it's background noise, at least to us at the Storm Center. You guys may not yeah, see it. Yeah, we, we, we all try to basically respond to all of this. Yeah. Last but year. Hold I on, mean, Andy. We all try to respond to all of this. I love to talk even when I'm moderate. We all try to respond to all of this. This is important. But remember, this is all good, goodwill based. Yeah. How can we respond to millions, right? So we, before we speak, Andy, I would really like this to, to hear the FBI's perspective because they really do a lot. The FBI has really advanced in these past few years on online crime and all that. Okay, this is DEFCON, I'm allowed to say this, shit. And we still don't see a difference. We, as far as I'm concerned, we lost the war. So I'd really like two, our two law enforcement members to comment on this. Well, first of all, from an FBI standpoint, um, the predicate behind the FBI getting involved is, first of all, a complaint. Um, it's not that the FBI isn't proactive, but there has to, first of all, be a complaint. If there's not a complaint, then there's nothing, I think it was mentioned earlier, we're not just going to start random, we're going to start calling people um, unless certain things actually happen. Um, so 
when you start, and, and then of course based on the complaint, once you actually get past the complaint, then we need to start talking about what minimal loss is. What, is, is there a minimal loss threshold that's been achieved before we're going to expend resources to go after uh, whatever's occurred? So you, you have two things you have to immediately look at before you're going to start going down that road. And if there's no complaint, then if somebody didn't file a complaint with the field office, there's nothing to get started on. So somebody has to complain. Anybody out there want to complain? <laughs> well, Andy, Andy. I think one, I just one, opened it up, right? So. One of the side effects of this problem, you know, last year at the same session, I made the comment that like one out of every five machines were infected. Everybody took a gasp. And I think that that's probably almost a conservative number at this point. Mm -hmm. We're, we're running into a problem is we recently are, have been going after some, some IRS phishing sites, which is nothing new. Uh, it's been a problem we've been dealing with since November of 2005. And in tracing back the source of the phishing site, we ended up executing a search warrant in Chicago uh, two months ago. And you know, to, just to really quickly summarize, this was a site that had not only uh, access to phishing site, but also downloaded some of the captured financial data. So that's why we targeted this one site. This was one out of about 100 and some addresses we had. So we went into the house, we executed a search warrant, got the computer out, and when we started looking at it, we stopped counting it. We found 104 viruses running on this machine. So not only does some of this noise type stuff cause problems for blips on the internet, it's causing real problems for us even trying to do real investigations because you basically lose any, any way of tracking anything at this point. Let me, um, let me also tell you how severe this problem is. A, a separate project that we're working on the side, and I'll give you the URL to this in a minute. A piece of darknet space is picking up over 100 new infections per day. And this is not just little trashy stuff. It, it's, it's the real mean evil botnets. Connect back to Russia, download their eggs, execute it. Bad stuff. I'll give you the URL later. But we're finding inside of it just every day they're coming up with the coolest, neatest ways to continue these infections. For example, most of you understand about codex, C-O-D-E-C. -E in other words, you go to some website, video won't play. It'll pop up a little thing that says, uh, we, we don't know how to do this. Uh, do you want to you know, install your own codec? Do you want to let Microsoft help you? Do you, you know, et cetera. What do most users do? Do you, you want to let Clippy help let's you? Let's let Microsoft help me, right? So your browser takes you off to codex.microsoft.com, which is where the stuff sits, or activex.microsoft.com if it's an um, ActiveX control that's missing. The bad guys have figured out how to use this. So they'll, they'll register malware with Microsoft. They'll register it as a codec. Your browser then redirects to get the codec. Microsoft points you off to some malware site, pulls it back as official Microsoft software, and now passes it over to you. You then install it because you think it's coming from Microsoft. But Microsoft has nothing to do with this. I'm not blaming them. They're just a little redirection here. But the user has no idea what's going on. They're just following some link. Some web page doesn't work. It's asking you to complete the little autocomplete box, and off they go. These little dark nets that we have out there that can find this stuff, it's picking up again over 100 per day of all this new stuff, and it's constantly changing day after day after day. And the, the guys in the antivirus world, they can't keep up with it. There's no way to publish signatures that fast in order for consumers to, uh, to keep themselves properly protected. You know, that's a good question. Are, are you waiting to ask something? Yeah, I have a question specifically related. Then one second. I want to continue on this. What are your takes? I mean, this is a very, this is a question we get all the time. Antiviruses, everybody uses them or supposed to use them. I don't, but most people have antiviruses. It's the one security tool we know people use. What are your, your takes? What is your take on this? Do you believe the antivirus really helps out there or should we just get rid of it? <laughs> Go for it, George. <laughs> well, I, I, I've spoken to uh, a, a fair number of uh, 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 webmasters, uh, administrators, and owners of systems, end users, and more often than not, not, not necessarily in the, in the word, but, uh, uh, but the, you, can, you can sense that they really don't care. Uh, I've had a number of people, say, especially when I was at Dartmouth, uh, faculty and students say, so what, when I inform them that their machine's been uh, attacking things in the network. Um, the Storm Center, I contact you know, a, uh, a provider and I'll get, oh, thanks very, very much, we'll take care of that. And they certainly don't for quite some time. Why not? Because it's not negatively impacting their business. I had a, uh, a very good relationship with an upstream provider when I, I used to host aldas.org. Any, any defacement folks in here, any Zone H people? Well, we got dust off the face of the earth, and we took them on just so we can collect information about the bad guys. 
And the upstream provider was very, very proactive with us in putting in place ways to m manipulate BGP tables um, so that we would go away, but not the rest of his network, uh, if and when, well, correction, when the attacks came downstream. And his CTO didn't get involved um, and start screaming at lawyers until after the DOS that came down the pipe was so big that it impacted not only us, but other customers of theirs. But there was, up until then, a, uh, a, a real lax attitude that I see providers, webmasters, administrators, end users. Now, is antivirus working? To a limited extent, until your license runs out and you don't feel like paying any money for it. And my nephew, I just cleaned his machine up, 50 some odd pieces of spyware malware. But it was okay because he could still get his papers in. Now, is there a symbiosis right now? Um, is, who in here can tell me they don't have any malware on their end user workstation? You're Probably lying. about thirty percent. About thirty percent of the room just said that, and well, the how many of them use Windows? <laughs> how many use Macs, right? So then, the rest of you, in some way, you're not freaking out. You're not calling the FBI. You're you're allowing this to exist. Now, maybe that's okay. Maybe we are going to approach a stasis if we don't don't know where you have one. Well, it's like your body. You've got all these parasites and stuff that are inside your you know your bowels. It's helping process your food, but you don't care, right? Andy, I do now. Andy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us I about didn't know your. That. Uh... Don't tell me. I don't think that antivirus works very much anymore because we're seeing a very significant increase in the number of targeted viruses, and I know that you know uh, there was a wave of viruses that were going out that were supposedly from the Big Better Business Bureau. And it was an RTF document we were supposed to download. And, you know, we saw that migrate now over to the IRS, which is how we got involved. Then it moved over to the Department of Justice. Then it moved back to the IRS again. And in every case, we saw about five or six variations. The first thing I do is I download everything, you know, using a Linux system, because I don't use Windows systems, because I'd be owned in about an hour. And, uh, you know, we run it through, you know, a virus total, and none of the antivirus engines picked it up. And I think that uh, anybody that's under the illusion that antivirus will protect you is very, very mistaken. I think it will help and it will take some noise off, but is not taking care of the targeted stuff. And I think it's even more interesting to see just how coordinated the bad guys have gotten. Would you like to talk about the storm? Because I think that's just No, no, we, no we not yet. Right, right now. We, we need to ask this okay. question, but let's yeah, just do a yes or no. Do you, do you guys, can, can you guys confirm what basically has been seen even in the press? Are we actually seeing a huge increase of very much targeted attacks, sometimes with zero days, going on out there. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is no longer myth. Nope. Let's go for the question. I'm really sorry you waited. That's a problem. This is actually a multi-part question. So I Go for it. You earned it. Uh, I work in information security for a financial institution, and when A&I came out, there was a whole lot of customers that just got bought and they got completely owned. We started Did you use a dessert patch, maybe? No? <laughs> Uh, He's never heard of Zert, sorry. So, no, not us. It was our customer base. So our customer base, they're getting owned, and people are getting their mind, credentials. Right? Yeah. And so we start to see anomalies, mind. and we start to see lots of money leaving the organization. Um, internal processes are, are stopping it. We file complaints with the FBI. Uh, we ended up finding controlling servers that um, were hosting this, that were checking balances, that were delegating work to other bots that were actually moving the money and making the transactions, and nothing seemed to happen. The only place as a private company that we could go to was the federal government. We don't want to just put out a post on full disclosure, hey, I work for Bank XYZ, and guess what's happening to my customers? Um, but in no offense, I don't know if you were busy fighting terrorists, but three days later, the server <laughs> in D.C. Hold on, hold on. Can we get that boo in three, two, one? Nice. But Wait, three so days later, is it, it's owned? still online. You're, you're no, not owners? our server. We found a controlling your server. server. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This <laughs> is just an anonymous <laughs> server on the internet. Anonymous server. That's that's checking balances for customers, and then after balances get to certain levels, other bots are from totally different geolocations are actually logging in and moving the money. We could tell it was very intelligent. Um, the person that wrote it knew exactly what they were doing. Um, and you but, used Ettercap to move that money to your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was me. I, 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 I want to get on a soapbox for a second and tell you. The problem here is that your bank should be using passwords. That's the crux of the problem. That's problem what solved. I'm sorry I didn't think of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh. you mean your friend didn't think of that. I'm Andy, sorry. I believe no, 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 no. the one thing My you're saying. My real question is what yes, can a private industry do when we don't want to get our name out there, but there's a problem that 
we didn't cause, it's affecting the customer base, and our internal security resources can provide a whole lot of information, but the federal government just doesn't seem to be doing anything Let about me it. ask you a question. Actually, two very quick questions, and then I want the feds to answer, okay? One, your entire first question, aside for the amazing complexity of the attackers, okay, are you basically saying, we may do the best security, but the security of our clients sucks, so we get impacted. That's what you're saying? Oh, well, definitely. It, okay, it, it ends one second, one second. Let's get to the second one, which actually we can answer. That was just a statement then. You asked, where can I go as a bank? So before we allow you to ask this question, because you really seem to, be know, to know what you're talking about, it should be up here. Um, does your no, bank send email to its users? No. You're allowed to, to get the answer now. Unlike most of the banks in the United States of America that educate their users to use email. Let's start with he Mark and go all the way. a very question that you guys need to answer. What yeah. happens when the private sector sits on really good actionable intelligence that they need to share with the government, but they can't due to information sharing restrictions or antitrust or whatever gets thrown well, into the Well, no, we did share it. We had agents come out. We gave them you? packet logs and everything. But Simon nothing Brown, We're involved happened. in it for guard, but three days later, it's still going on. And, of course, we're... We're black holing them at the firewall, but it's still going um, on in this particular. Were these domestic sites? Domestic sites. The server was hosted in a colo space in D.C. I thought that you know maybe an agent could just walk over and pull the plug. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Kick the door in. Um, Andy. Um, well, unfortunately, I have a very targeted uh, jurisdiction, which is the IRS. And I can tell you if it was an IRS box, I would have walked across the street, taken the box, and probably the router it was connected to as well. Um, damn FBI. Well, let me qualify. <laughs> Why did I know that was coming? Now, in the FBI's defense, I do believe the FBI is running several organizations, such as InfraGuard and a lot of websites to get people to talk to them and conferences. At least actually DHS. Let's be honest here. But what, what, sorry, you were starting to talk. Not really. <laughs> I just said uh, I knew that was coming. Um, well, I guess my question to you is, you, you, you said you, I just want to get the facts straight. So you said agents came out, made copies, yes. you shared it. We gave them everything. Okay, so the complaint was made. Complaint was made. Who was that complaint made to? A local field office? Local field office. People that we have a relationship through. With, FBI through received regard. the service, by the way. Uh, FBI. Okay. FBI. Um, in Washington Field? You said D.C. Well, I'm not saying where I'm from. The server was in D.C., but uh, local, major city. And uh, let me qualify it by saying we That's prevented 56. We prevented all the wire transfers or recalled all the wire transfers before there was an actual loss to us, but we still I filed want an account complaint. in your bank. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So there was no loss. Yeah, that's the thing. So at the end of the day, because our internal processes caught it, and in some cases we were called wires before they hit the Fed processing deadline at the other bank and actually went overseas where we just lose track of the money, we ended up getting it all back. But that was us being a good security team, and with us giving this information to the FBI, there's other organizations that could have been impacted, and the servers that were actually performing this work that were casing the accounts, waiting for balances, and performing the work and moving the money they were still up, and they were still attempting to attack us Okay. days later. So there was no loss initially. I'm not, I'm not trying to discount the fact Correct. that there should Officially have been activity. At the end of the day, there I'm, was I'm just no saying loss. that there was we, no loss. We prevented it. Right. You prevented the loss. One second, please. One second. The you amount of time up here, he spent no, prevent the come loss. Up, stand behind, beside him. No, but, now, okay. but he has an excellent point because uh, there was a loss. I mean, he was saying there wasn't a loss, but he has an actual excellent point because the time you spent... Um, to ensure there wasn't a loss is, in fact, a loss to your company. So when I, when I bring up the fact, the idea of a loss, once a complaint has been established, when I bring up the idea of a loss, that includes any time you spent to prevent a loss or, or trace a loss, or, you know, all the hours that went into getting that money back. So, so My wife was pissed at me for a week. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to put that in the form of a dollar value. But, <laughs> but there may very I can well probably be. come up with a number. No, but guys, we have seen these problems many times in the past. The FBI, for example, that really is doing an amazing job. I, I don't mind so, putting people down when I need to. 
This no. is a real problem. Do, maybe you can answer it yeah, in a better question. Yeah, I guess part of the larger question is we, what does no, private no, no, industry no, honestly, do? Just call a field office? Or? Everybody will answer What's it over here, especially right Mark. But you, you're really onto something here. Unless we can show a loss, and how do you show a loss for a botnet, right? How, how can we even report this? I mean, we want to complain. Uh, what's the process for us? What do we need to have before we go and file a complaint? Well, you, you have the Internet Crime Complaint Center. You have the local field office. You have, and, and they're expanding that. Uh, tremendously. So you have uh, a method to be able to call a field office. Now, you, you also said that nothing was being done. Um, from what I could tell. From what you could tell. But the servers were still up days later. Yes. And, and that was a very key point because, first of all, um, it takes time after that to go through whatever you turned over, okay, the amount of time it took to go. And, and if there's something that clearly is time sensitive or whatever, they may actually elicit the help of you to help target where the issue is. Um, but after that, it's still innocence until proven guilty. So uh, you, you're not going to go in and pull the plug um, unless several other factors are met. Um, and, and, we're and again, we're still talking about something right now where essentially there was no monetary loss other than the loss, and I don't know what that was quantified at. So now we have to get a warrant, swear out a warrant. U.S. Attorney or Assistant U.S. Attorney has to be involved and has to want to do that, depending on the amount of loss that was attempted. You guys to be don't made need there. warrants. You got the Patriot Act, right? <laughs> Bad comparison. No, no, guys, guys. As much as we are enjoying DefCon, let's be serious for a second because he's giving him an answer. Okay. So um, nice shot, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not true. Um, I'm sorry. You're doing a good job. <laughs> But um, generally, the FBI looks at a, a, a broader perspective, and, and um, the pleasure that we oftentimes have is looking at, and I think um, Jim Finch tried to mention this during the Fed panel, they get to see um, from, a fifth, from a perspective of 56 field offices from around the country that you're having this problem and somewhere in Podunk, USA, is having the same problem, and you, you get to be able to put it together, and it may be transferred to another field office, or, or it, it happens daily, hourly sometimes, uh, every day. So I don't think it's fair to say they weren't doing anything. So the, the other thing is they don't have a responsibility to come back to you and say what they're doing. Um, and I understand the perception here uh, that generally sometimes you say the FBI is not doing anything. Um, that's a valid complaint, essentially, because you don't get to see what happens. Um, are we perfect at it? Are, would it be a good idea to maybe come back and tell you step by step what we're doing to reassure? We can't do that. But we can come out here today and tell you um, crimes like that essentially are in the top three, especially if it involves the infrastructure. And, and it sounds like a cliche answer after saying that standing up here, but. It, it really is an answer. I mean, it, we try to expend every amount of resources, and we're getting additional resources to be able to do that because there clearly is a concerted attack on our infrastructure and the vulnerabilities. But I commend you for the efforts that you went through to protect your own bank, and, and we're hoping for that level of cooperation, certainly um, from what you folks do. And the, the talent that we I've come across here um, humbles me, and you guys have – you are that first line. and. The, the federal government is going to depend upon you to do that job, and maybe we can do a better job to help you help us in turning over that information and keeping it, keeping the integrity of that data uh, pure enough to be able to enter into court later should it come to a trial of some sort. But um, that's a tremendous role that you all play, and I think you're minimizing to a certain extent the role that you all have um, in reaching a certain point because we really are bound contrary to the little shot across my bow about the Patriot Act, we really are bound um, by uh, probable cause and being able to swear out a warrant. Uh, we do not, never take it lightly to be able to go into a business or someone's house, um, or Congress for that matter. Um, uh, and, and you can see all the crap that that started. So it, it really is a serious issue. and, and um, uh, we mentioned it earlier this morning. Uh, we all believe in those liberties as much as you do. And when you invade someone's privacy, uh, there's a, a big issue there. And so we have to prove certain things. And, and 
there's um, that's oftentimes not very easy to do, and, and judges are just as skeptical as most people in this room. There's With also a quick follow lot of that stuff out there too. I mean, we have a limited number of resources. Yes, and, you know, and the, the FBI volume. Has, has put forth an all kidding aside. I mean, the FBI probably has more resources, you know, per capita of, of cyber investigators than any other agency anywhere. I'm working on a couple of cases right now, and one of them involved the botnet, and that's way beyond the resources of my agency. The first thing I did was reached out to the FBI because they have that those resources. So, and there's a botnet law enforcement portal. Yeah. Um, Botnet conferences, there's one next week or the following week. Uh, I've been to the one in France last time. I mean, there's tremendous resources going. The, and we're very aware of the issues associated with botnets. Is there anything private industry can do to expedite that portion of your job that you just talked about? So once the complaint's made, it help gathering information or getting you in touch with customers that were personally owned or personally impacted? What can private industry do to you expedite here, that process? You're far better at it than me. Yeah. Come on. Come no, up. no, 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 no. No, and I'm getting the impression Everybody that people up. are very. Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You moderator. So we need some new questions. This is my first duty as moderator. Everyone come hear my talk tomorrow on hacking online banking. I'm Brendan. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. You've got a question. Uh, kind of going back to, to antivirus and whether or not they're useful anymore, I guess you were talking about that, that Darknet site that, you, that you know, is finding, uncovering hundreds of these. I guess your average home user you know, does a Google search, check their email, maybe check their online bank account. How long are you seeing from these, these Darknet sites where they, they release this stuff to where it gets to the point where it infects your average home user, and do you think that the antivirus companies are doing a good job of More of kind of keeping up with that, or do they try? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's answer the first part first. At the Storm Center, we've been running a, uh, everybody's familiar with DShield Trust, right? So those of you who are submitting your DShield logs, very helpful, thank, thank you, you, and I appreciate it. What that shows, though, we can go in and see how long it takes for an infection to infect somebody. And we've done this for about three or four years now. The average is a little less than 20 minutes. So across the Internet, on average, average ISP, a little under 20 minutes from when you plug in to when you're going to get hit with some malware, just directed to your, your home router. Does that mean you get infected in less than 20 minutes? Not necessarily. That's an average, okay? So some ISPs will be 20 hours, some will be 20 seconds. It's you know, hard to tell where it's coming from. But the number keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter in terms of the amount of time. This is the, the amount of time between different unsolicited flows, hostile flows coming at any given IP address out on the Internet. That's somewhat scary, that the Internet has gotten so hostile that all you do is just connect to it. And you guys have all tried this. Just hook a naked machine up to the, up to the Internet, sit back and watch, and it'll get owned. I mean, you don't have to do anything. Just, just now, if you're a little more interactive, it goes a lot faster. <laughs> Surf a few websites and just you know infect yourself, silly. But, but the time is getting shorter and shorter. And even for Mac users, while the time may be real wide right now, you're still receiving the love. Even it, uh, the love doesn't doesn't realize what you've got on the other end of it. All you got to do is click on the wrong link, and you're off and running. Great question, though. Yeah, I've got one thing to add to that, Mark. Um, uh, I run this uh, set of scripts called uh, Tiny Honeypot, and uh, when I was on dial-up for the longest time, I had a uh, dial-up, for God's sakes. I'm in, in Podunk, Vermont, sheep country, um, and on a dial-up, not even 56K connection, it was 20 some odd K. Uh, I was getting about 7,000 content carrying attacks launched against my box per day on dial-up. How many folks have got broadband persistent connections right now? Um, you're seeing this stuff. Everybody want to clap for Dan Kaminsky, who's far too important to be here on time. <laughs> He's not well, drunk well, enough. There, there was beer here, so I. I... <laughs> yeah, beer. There you go. So I, I actually did want to comment on one thing about the uh, the twenty minute attack. Um, yes, you are attacked about every twenty minutes. It's been like three or four years since most of those attacks have worked, mm -hmm. and so it's actually really interesting. We get two things from that. First, security has advanced to the point we actually have a win under our belt. Every single one of you in this room, for the most part, you're not going to be vulnerable if you plug in the box. 
You'll get attacked. You're not going to get owned. Where are the attacks coming from? The attacks are coming from everywhere. But that's the interesting thing. They're owned. That's what's so crazy. There apparently are enough machines out there that are still unpatched and still ancient that even though all of us are probably going to be fine, uh, the attackers are losing nothing by making these huge floods. So machines are getting owned, but they're probably not getting owned by the same things that are causing these, these traffics to spike out. And that's where we're getting into, like, we have a lot of multi-layer attacks going on. Frankly, everything seems to have moved to the web. Sorry, I get to ask a question now. Um, how, ma yeah, how, many, how many owned machines does it take to ruin the internet for everyone? 200. <laughs> <laughs> mine. Closer mine Unless you have something really cool going on, if you only want to do it very, well, go, okay, stupidly, 200. Actually, the internet is not going to die tomorrow. I don't want anybody quoting me on that. Oh, my God. Mm. If in... 2004, everybody remembers Sasser, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when Microsoft released the vulnerabilities for Sasser, the day before that, Cisco released a very nice little vulnerability about TCP resets for, uh, for routers. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the payload in Sasser would have included a little bit of Cisco TCP reset in there, just aimed at the core, mm -hmm. 200 machines, could have had a field day. Who wrote Sasser? <laughs> What the hell? Can you dude? imagine if that actually you worked? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moderator, you need to take over. You need to cut people off. I mean, you're good at this. You just need to learn how to do it. Don't talk as much. No, you need to do what I do, just not talk as much. All right. So take I'm over. There are questions here. Question. Hey. Well done. Walk on. I wanted to come back to what uh, the FBI was talking about and how the distribution of the field offices allows you to kind of correlate and see one thing in another play, you know, see patterns emerge. I mean, in a way, it sounds like it's what ISC does in terms of the, you know, actual raw data. You know, do you guys talk? I mean, the, it seems like the FBI field office, model, you know, if you're, if you're going by what people report, it's going to be what's most notable, and you might miss larger patterns. So how do you kind of bridge the notable to the technical reality of what's going on underneath? Um, we have a great uh, infrastructure within the FBI to talk uh, through VTC and conference calls, and, and it's come a long way in the last couple of years. Uh, I don't exactly know the hierarchy of how it gets up where it is, but communication obviously is key. Um, I'm, I'm sorry Jim Finch couldn't stay today. Uh, he would have been the ideal person, but uh, he really did. This was an eye-opening experience for him, um, a, a tremendously eye-opening experience. And, and he went back with just a, a tremendous attitude. And um, he's immediately going to make some changes from a cyber division standpoint. Um, uh, many of you, I'll give you an example, and I, I'm not trying to divert from your question, but well, we got a few minutes left and two more questions. Okay, uh, good point. <laughs> There's a good moderator. But right. actually, that's a very good way to tell him to. Uh, mm? Yeah, but exactly. we actually have unlimited time, kinda. Uh, but we were made aware of an email, an InfraGuard email that came out yesterday, uh, that came up to him, and he's immediately going to. Uh, demand a uh, response, an apologetic response. <laughs> so um, that, that's the type of attitude he's taking. But there's many different avenues of how things get reported. And uh, it's, it's a hierarchy that can somewhat be very complex. That's oftentimes, uh, it come, it, it's basically broken down into good communication and then uh, supervisors and, and, and SACs and ASACs in the field pretty much know exactly how to get that to the right level. But Again, it's all these different uh, issues involving uh, what the U assistant U.S. attorneys are doing and minimum thresholds and what the complaint is. And um, so it's, there's not an easy, quick answer for that question. Next you question. can't ask us unless the motivator tells him to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so cool. 
we know there's a lot of users out there that think multi-factor authentication is a user is a username and a password. Um, <laughs> uh, right, right, both factors. Yeah, um, you know, E-Trades had RSA token, you know, their thing for a while. PayPal just instituted that. Um, there are tons of banks out there, high-value targets, right? They don't do multi-factor authentication. What do you think we can See do? See my talk tomorrow. It's <laughs> on just that. Yeah, what do you think we can do to get banks to actually, uh, and other high-value targets, to actually institute something like that or open ID? Move your bank account to those that do it. That's an excellent point. I think you folks um, are there that can help educate, just much like we try to educate the management within the Bureau, you can educate your corporate officers and, and your supervisors and the importance, but that's an excellent point. I mean, go to a bank that does do it, and once it hits their bottom line, then they'll realize that this is what their public or their customers want is more security. That's and the answer. It has, has to hit the bank in the wallet right. or the customer in the wallet, because right. right now it's not. The industry is regulating, and the regulation does absolutely nothing. I would so. actually add to that. We can, we can look at, at, uh, at uh, Great Britain or maybe even Australia, Canada. They do an amazing job of cooperating on security in the banking industry. In the States, they have a lot of cooperation, too. I'm not saying no. But in the States, you actually compete on security when you know, absolutely know, that whether it's another country or another bank, it goes around in a circle and will come back at you. So the first thing I would say banks need to do is understand this is a shared problem, a shared history of problems to be considered in your risk assessment, not just your history, and simply cooperate. That will be the first step, in my opinion. Well, a depressing number of the online banks can't even get SSL right. Mm -hmm. Very true. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I do think it's important to realize something that doesn't come up in the security realm often, which is usability. Um, you know, you take the number of people who can understand how to program, and then a small number of them understand security, and then a really, really small number of them understand security and usability. In order to get better authentication to be something that people actually use, it, it kind of needs to be usable. And so there's a lot of energy going on out there to create the next big authentication mechanisms, and I think who's going to win is who makes the most usable and useful system. It's just our job as security people to make sure, you know, it doesn't suck. <laughs> next question. All right, so uh, some of you guys have mentioned that uh, a lot of the exploits are starting to move to just almost all client sides, and we're not seeing like these big internet scale events like like uh, SQL Slammer or stuff like that. Yeah, their worms are gone, and and these just like super major events don't happen anymore. Um, oh, they happen. They just happen client side. Right. That, that's what I'm saying. Is that um, or that, that's kind of what I'm wondering about. I guess is that uh, since since you're not seeing this big automated spread that shows up and as big traffic spikes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, how is that impacting your, uh, all of your kind of understanding of the, the current landscape and, and how are you discovering these, you know, the, the new client sites that are starting to be real big problems? Sure. So it's moved away from uh, the scanning activity and stuff like that, that, that D-Shield was, was really useful for about three years ago. And, and I almost never go to D-Shield now. I'm sorry, Marcus. Thank you. It's, 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 <laughs> not, it's not on my radar anymore. Everything, everything that we're looking at now is coming from uh, users reporting infected websites. It's coming from honey clients. You know, people need to, to start deploying more of these systems. Uh, so that we can catch these infected websites and, and figure out, you know, what's going on and how large the scale is. Because right now, you know, we see it crop up and we say, okay, we can go search Google and we find out how many other sites are infected. Uh, but it, it's, just, it's just crazy how well they can hide these things and yet how many users they can infect before uh, anybody actually finds out about it. I mean, every day, I mean, we, we turn around and we find stolen data caches uh, in, in, our, in our monitoring and we find you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 50,000 users, you know, that they might infect, and this is just over the course of a few weeks. Uh, so it's very easy for them to, to just fly under the radar like this. So, um, yeah, the, the, the honey client type of technology, I think, is, is the next big thing in terms of, of detecting this. And, and I hope DShield has uh, something in the works for well, Here's what we do. DShield is, is, is IP port based. It's going to be technical, nothing we can do about that. There's always still that background radiation. It's interesting. 
But what's really helped us is the human intrusion detection. In other words, system administrators, users that see something's wrong, they don't understand it, a piece of malware that shows up, and then they call and tell, or send us a note and tell us. So that level, it's taking malware, which is now more of a psychological approach. It's, it's not attacking your machine at the machine level, it's attacking users who can do stupid user tricks. Those users, through their system administrators, are alerting us. So it's almost like a layer eight type of detection versus a layer two, three, four detection. So we have to change the way we do things because the types of attacks have changed also. Unfortunately, that it usually takes a few weeks for it to trickle down before they discover exactly what's going on, figure it out, and get somebody technical enough involved right. to look at it and say, oh, well, we need to report this to you know somebody right. who knows it. But with the targeted attacks also, it's not Internet-wide. And so things tend to be a little more focused, a little not, not, not just target attacks, actually, work. zero days. Everybody has been saying things that have become buzzwords right now, such as uh, Wednesday, uh, zero day Wednesday or zero day Friday and stuff like that. And what we've actually seen, and Mark can probably continue this better, is that this is really our OI related. It will be released on a Friday after uh, Patch Tuesday, but only if the ROI requires it, they will not waste a zero day. Mark, you can probably oh, say yeah. more. I mean, the whole thing is business related. Uh, if, are there any bad guys in the audience? Anybody writing malware? I mean, I mean, no kidding. It's, it's why would you release malware today other than to profit from it? Joe, it's, it's you, academic, yeah. right? I mean, that's fun. But Mark, it's Joe, you, you're both on dirt, yeah. right? And dirt showed up because of all this. Can you elaborate a little bit, little bit on this, Joe? Sure. So uh, when the the zero day attacks are coming out, we know that there's a a, a window of opportunity for the bad guys that were. Uh, you know, it's going to be out there plugging away, infecting everybody, and, and nobody's got a patch for it. So. Uh, you know, concerned individuals, you know, came together with Gaddy and, and organized the Zert and, and, you know, we're trying to delve into the, the finer bits of the code and try to figure out if we can release a patch in time to, you know, save a few networks for people that want to use it. You know, some people don't, uh, and I can understand that. But, uh, you know, we're trying to, uh, to get out there and, and protect the Internet, you know, as best we, as we know how. We have, you know, the skill, so we want to want to volunteer that. Yeah, we in the last year, we've done one, right? Three. No, no, no. Oh. In, in just in the last 12 yeah. months. Yeah, the last year. Total of three since Zert started. And uh, we, by the way, have been working closely with Microsoft on this because at first it upset them. Do you all know what Zert is? Does that hopefully ring some bells, right? So after WMF last year, this was 18 months ago roughly, the Windows Metafile problem, uh, a team had already began to crank out this, this concept of can we issue a patch faster than Microsoft can, an unofficial patch. And so... Um, dropping the guy's name. Who was it that did the? Ilfak. Ilfak yeah, of course. Issued the uh, unofficial patch. Well, many people installed it. And it worked great. Microsoft and others complained, said, no, no, this is not official. Yeah, we don't sure. warrant, etc." Well, the Zert kind of came out of that. It said, you know, there might be the opportunity that if there really is something fairly straightforward that fixes or at least temporarily patches, let's just put it out there. And it's your choice whether you use it or not. You make the business decision. How much is at risk financially should you get infected by the zero day? Does it make a good financial decision to put in this temporary unofficial patch? Once Microsoft comes out with theirs, or whoever, and, and Microsoft, all three have been Microsoft, if I remember correctly, is that right? All three of ours have been Microsoft, right? I think, yeah. All three of ours so far have been Microsoft, but we are not against Microsoft. No, that's right. It's just the way it's worked, right? But as soon as they I come wonder. out with theirs, the Zert patch disappears, and we push real hard to do the official patching. So. The Zert function is alive and well. The zero days, though, particularly with Office products, magically ended back in about February, March. Did you guys notice that? It's kind of been this drop off in zero days. Been some neat behind the scenes things happening. Finding the groups that were writing the zero days over in China. I guess where that you know <laughs> where that comes from, and uh, working kind of behind the scenes to make that disappear. But that's. There are lots of people you don't see at the table here that do the behind the scenes cleanup largely volunteer effort, some of it's corporate, um, trying to make the Internet a safer place. I don't think it'd be even appropriate to put all these folks up on the stage because most of them don't want you to know who they are. But it's almost like the, um, you know, the cyber vigilantes that really Don't are. use that don't word. Use that term. Any don't press, use the term vigilante. Yeah. <laughs> but the good guys. No, this is really good bad guys. for us. We mean vigilante as in neighborhood watch because honestly, as much as we want the FBI, the IRS, everyone else to do this, change the economics, make a difference, put these guys make behind bars, yep. we need to protect our networks, maintain our livelihood on the Internet while we wait. So we may in some cases actually be harming their efforts while we wait for them to do something, and they are doing a lot. Just, again, their resources and issues and things we can't see, 
In the meantime, we need to keep working on this. And Zert, for example, we have been, although this is, of course, one directional, Microsoft has been very nice, though, we have been trying to, to share whatever we can and tell people don't use our patches if you have a real patch out there. Wrap it up, Gary. You need to wrap it up. <laughs> You're the moderator. I'll speak as much as I want. I'm in the pal now. One more question, though. All right, this is a topic after the moderator's own heart. Um, back to the uh, the original question about uh, banking assistance with uh, with trojans and viruses and that, well phishing that sort of thing. Um, in our experience, well, we learned several years ago that the feds were pretty useless at helping us if for urgent uh, problems. Um, but now we do go to you guys. But whether, when we actually request assistance is when we've done most of the legwork and we need help urgently. And then you get that, you know, you report it, and several days go by. What's being done to, uh, to actually help out in terms of yeah. getting things done urgently, given the legwork we're already doing to collect evidence and things like that? I think Gaddy wants me to wrap it up. Yeah, look, who's the question, question to? After this question? Yeah. Okay. Who's the question to? Uh, to the feds. To the feds. Specifically FBI. Um, so what's been done to more urgently respond to a request? Yeah, given that we do most of the legwork ourselves in terms of collecting the information and attempting to get things shut down. Well, one of the things, uh, one of the methods that we use to come in and actually take the evidence from you or suspected evidence is a consensual warrant. So if a agent comes out, um, they're going to ask you to sign a consensual warrant. So at that point, we can take custody of what you've essentially taken, right? So a consensual warrant, a consensual warrant is you're giving us permission to come. You own that. That's your data. You own that. So you're now giving us permission to take custody of it. Um, uh, hang on. I'm just going to cut you off there. My point is, um, in our experience, a friendly call from a field agent to an ISP or a hosting company goes a long way in getting things shut down without requiring a warrant. And often that, that doesn't get done. You go through the whole legal process, which takes the time when you could have done the incident response work and made a phone call. I don't understand the premise of the phone call, though. As in, can you shut this server down? This is special agent, whatever your name is. Or can you and take a say, look yes. at this well, server? Yeah, and, and that happens traffic. a lot. I mean, they'll actually go out to the ISP or s send a lead to another field office if it's halfway across the country and ask someone to go out and talk to this ISP. I mean, we, we're very proactive about having relationships with ISPs, especially major ISPs in major cities. So they'll some send someone out to actually talk to that ISP. And generally, sometimes with a phone call, they will do that. Uh, obviously, in the circumstance that you're talking about, or a couple or many, I'm not sure, that obviously didn't happen. But I, I know that happens. I mean, we do shut them down or ask them to be shut down or taken offline or for whatever reason. We will do that. They'll, they'll issue F letters, preservation letters, we'll, we'll, you know, again, within the bounds of what we can to do, what we can do legally. Do those laws not need to be changed? Absolutely. The FBI does not change those laws. So, um, all right. We're going to do within the IRS and phishing sites. I can tell you that there's been a big change in ISPs from 2005 to the current time. In the early days, it was, it was sometimes difficult to get an ISP to shut a phishing site down. And I think pretty much worldwide, if, you, if I call an ISP and I say, listen, I'm with the government, we have a phishing site, it's hosted on your server, here's the URL, here's an email showing them from a .gov, will you help us by shutting it down? Generally, it's shut down within minutes. And I've done about 370 of them since 2005, and I think that's pretty easy. Now, getting the data afterwards isn't necessarily so easy. I need Especially to cut you off. Please don't audit me. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do 30-second wrap-up here. So each speaker, 30-second closing statements, please. Starting over there. Okay. Um, ultimately, it's up to the users, the folks that actually depend upon these things and value their resources. So all, all I can say is to win the Internet war, every single person out there that values their stuff has to stop being a lamer. <laughs> Apply BCPs, all right? Egress filtering if you're a provider. Keep yourself updated. Be aware of what's going on and just don't be a lamer and they can't win. Here, read his email to us. Tell us what's on there. You have an incoming call from Riot. <laughs> hey, what's up, Ash? 
You're burning your 30, uh, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what I, I'll just reemphasize quickly what I said before. Um, you actually play a tremendous role. Don't minimize your role in what you do. Uh, don't give up hope. There's, there's a lot going on on the federal side. Many of you don't see. Be proactive. Above all, be patient. Understand that we're sometimes as frustrated as you are, but we work within the bounds of what the laws allow us to do, and I know you appreciate that, um, e even though you think the Patriot, Law, Patriot Act may have expanded those capabilities in many respects, uh, just as an example. But we're certainly very conscious of what those laws allow us to do, and sometimes that takes significant time. But uh, hopefully what we try to emphasize here this weekend is not to minimize what your role is. You, 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 the talent here, this Five has seconds. just been... Uh, and it, it's been an incredible experience for me. Um, I, I must say, DEFCON rocks, and th this has been awesome this weekend. Thank you. Yeah. I'd just like to say that if you expect that the FBI is going to do incident response for you, you're going to be very disappointed. Um, the thing is that other countries actually have uh, CERT teams that actually do incident response and aren't just information clearing houses. Uh, so I think everybody we could really three, two, one. Ooh. I think we could uh, really use some pressure, I guess, on DHS to perhaps turn CERT into that and, and maybe pass a law that gives CERT the authority to, to go to ISPs and actually say you've got malicious activity, take this IP down. Because they can do that in other countries. They, you look at uh, South Korea. They, by law, any ISP operating South Korea has to conform to the CERT's uh, demands if, if they detect malicious activity and report it to them. Uh, and so this, this is the role that people expect the FBI to take, but, you know, it, it's, that's not what their role is. Clean your own backyards. Yeah, I think we have a, a, a long road to hoe. It's going to be at least five years, I think, before we are able to turn the tides on any of this. So it's going to get a lot worse, much worse, if the trends continue. And there's nothing that says that they, they won't stop. Um, I'm a pessimist at this point because I haven't seen anything actually change the trend. And uh, I'm, I'm ready to find something outside of the box because these things aren't working. and. The, all the major attempts that we've seen um, were always beat. So I'm, I'm in a pretty sad state right now. There's uh, a lot of work to be done, and it's You sound just, sad. I, yep, thanks. Oh. Well, it probably is all the beer from yesterday. <laughs> it's just my hangover talking. So um, we're, we're five years out, and my prediction is that uh, this will be an issue for heads of state within three to five years. Um, and it's, it's already gone that high in Japan, so... Yeah, I think my uh, perception is that the uh, financial crime is increasing exponentially. And I think that by next year, you'll refer to this as the good old days. I think short of getting little submarines under the ocean, clipping little wires, we're going to see a lot more problems. And I think that, you know, we're going to have to rely on you to, to assist us. We can't do it all. We don't have the records. We don't have the networks. Uh, the FBI can't do it all. Secret Service, who for whatever reason never seems to show up to DEF CON, you know, they do a lot of the banking stuff. They're not here. Uh, they can't do it all. IRS can't do it all. Um, it's going to take a lot of work. But uh, I'm sure five years from now we'll still be talking. There will still be an Internet. We'll still probably be working, doing something, although I'll probably be retired by then. But uh, it'll, it'll continue. Geography is dead. So um, all jurisdiction that guides law enforcement is based on the idea that most of the people that you interact with are geographically close to you. And as you get farther and farther away, there are more significant crimes, but less people you're interacting with. Now, all of us, we live in a world where geography is dead. But the old model of law enforcement continues. And when we even talk about up to the point of heads of state, states are geographical locations. We actually have a political and law enforcement system that does not interact accurately with the new threats that we're facing. And what I want to have everyone understand is that is why we don't get 24-hour response, like calling 911 on, you know, someone hacking you. You know what, they're in Malaysia. 911 doesn't do anything. 
So that's the problem that we have, and everyone should understand it. So the internet continues to get worse, which it will. All of you who are security professionals will continue to profit, which yes. you will. There are many, many years of prosperity, ladies and gentlemen. Do not let the people outside of this conference know that, okay? Just make them think all is well. Okay, criminals dominate. We know that. Espionage is certainly on the rise. Everything on the internet has value. The bad guys know that. They're off to get it. You are valuable people. You have a value, valuable commodity, so be sure that you increase your value by staying in touch. Two websites, Internet Storm Center, you all know where it is. Make sure it's bookmarked or it should be your homepage when it comes up. But, Bummer. Yeah. But listen, there's one other thing, and I mentioned it earlier, that's that dark net. I want you to take a look at it. We put a diary out last Tuesday, if you want to go read about it, but go to cyber-ta, C-Y-B-E-R-T-A.org. Take a look at that dark net. Look at the malware that's coming in, that 100 new infections per day. It will blow your mind. What you'll also find is all the source IPs where it's coming from. You'll find the DNS queries that it's doing. You'll find the malware itself, both packed and unpacked. You can look at the system call traces. You can see what all the evilware is doing just by clicking on some web links. If you would like to infect yourself, keep clicking. All the bad stuff's there. Infect yourself silly if that's what you like to do. Obviously, that's a, ca a bit of caution because there is evil on that website. So make sure you're running proper prophylactic measures. Otherwise. This is fun. I'm looking forward to drinking some beer with all y'all tonight. Have a nice evening. Gaddy, it's yours. I'm going to try and do it in 10 seconds, otherwise it will be an hour. Um, I'm actually an optimist. I believe there is a lot we can do. We know what we need to do. Tomorrow's trends... Shut up. <laughs> Tomorrow's... Trends are things we are currently aware of but are not taking care of, which is kind of sad. And being an optimist, I can tell you, current, the current situation is completely lost. We are, in fact, in the losing position after World War II, meaning after World War I, I'm sorry. Our terms are right now, after we lost the war, are being dictated by the bad guys. Why am I still an optimist? Because people rise to the cause. And there are a lot of people in the room still sitting. And if you want to help, if you want to get together with this, you can. Because as much as the FBI is doing a lot of work, as much as Andy and the IRS, and everybody is doing a ton of work out there, what the fuck is going on with your cell phone already? Defcon, I say a lot of fuck, 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 OK. But seriously now. <laughs> it's a personal vibrator. It's a personal vibrator, right, OK, right, OK. So let's look, seriousness for a second. You can get involved, really, because the FBI can investigate and try to turn the tide if they are given the power to do so, and recently they have been given more and more authority, policy-wise, to take care of this kind of stuff. They don't yet have the, 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 the right... Um, the big guys upstairs don't let them do their job yet, in my opinion, and we still need to take care of our own business. So get involved, take care of your networks first, then come join the Storm Center and go to... the to a bleeding edge for, to work on snort signatures, other stuff, work, shadow server, working with botnets, a lot of good stuff out there, and you can help. So this whole idea, all the questions we're trying to answer, all this misery we are giving to you by being in the, on the front lines and seeing all of this shit, and I'm way past 10 seconds, <laughs> is, guys, yes, we already lost the war to make the internet safe. It never was safe. It was an open environment, open to abuse to begin with but it can be used safely if we work for it. Thank you.